This year has been a pandemic year. Children are hurting all over the world. People are afraid, families are scared. People have lost their jobs. They don't know where to go, what to do. They don't know what hope they have for the future. Well, I want every child to know that God loves them, that God has not forgotten them, and that He cares for them very much. And when you pack a shoebox and send it to Operation Christmas Child, it gives us an opportunity to give that box to a child and do it in Jesus' name. Can you just imagine the hope and the thrill and the joy of when a kid opens up a lid like this and all these toys are in it? It's an incredible gift. And so I just want to say thank you. We need your help this year more than we've ever needed it because of the pandemic. It's just going to create a lot more opportunity. Thank you and God bless you. And remember, pray for the children of the world. Hi, Pleasant Valley. Tracy here. Pastor Jerry asked me to tell you about something that's coming up this Saturday, October 23rd. We are having our annual spaghetti fundraising dinner for Samaritan's Purse Operation Christmas Child Two Boxes. All the money from the fundraiser goes to help fill the boxes and mail the boxes to children around the world uh, with the Gospel of Jesus Christ. We hope you'll participate. You will get your delicious spaghetti dinner for $12. It comes with garlic bread, salad, um, and dessert. And this year we're doing it pickup style. So I'll tell you how to do it. You're going to call Kim or email her and she will take your order or orders depending on how many you want. And then she'll also tell you where you're going to go to pick up your Dinner. We have a north end location and a west end location, so you'll be able to um, pick up your dinner on Saturday, October 23rd, between 4.30 and 6 p.m. We hope you'll participate, and I hope to see you Saturday. Thank you. Good morning. Happy Sunday, and welcome home to Pleasant Valley Church. My name is Terry, and I am so glad that you have chosen to worship with us here this morning. If this is one of your first times worshiping with us, an extra special welcome to you. I'm so glad that you're here. I would love to connect with you and see if there's any way that we as a church can love and serve you. Perhaps there's something that we can be praying about for you or a situation in your life. Simply give me a call or send me an email. In return, I would love to send you this free book if you live in the Brantford area called Hope in the Dark. It's a great read for these days that we are going through. Well, you've already heard the announcement from Tracy about our Operation Christmas Child Shoebox campaign that is, uh, that is launching. And if you need empty shoeboxes, we've got them. We can arrange for a porch pickup or a porch drop-off. Um, let's keep on loving people. Let's keep on loving kids around the world. This is a great opportunity for us not only to think locally, but to think globally and share God's love in that direction. So just contact me at the church office and you can start picking up these empty shoe boxes as soon as this afternoon, Sunday afternoon. Tracy gave us a great announcement about an initiative that Youth Ministries is undertaking about this spaghetti fundraising dinner. There's a cost associated with shipping shoe boxes, and we want to help alleviate that cost by, by providing a meal and raising money so it would defer those, those costs, those payments, uh, for sending those shoe boxes. And again, you're invited to participate in that. One thing that I'd like to add into Tracy's announcement is that we need to know by this Thursday at 6 p.m. Uh, what your intentions are, how many meals we need to make, where you can be picking them up or, or getting them from. Contact Kim Hansen by 6 p.m. on Thursday with your intentions regarding the meal. The shoe boxes themselves will be, will be receiving them until the second Sunday of November. If you're able to hold on to them until then, uh, that's great, but if you can, if it's just taking up too much space, uh, contact me at the church office and we'll make arrangements where we can receive them and then pass them on to Samaritan's Purse. Two things are really true about Pleasant Valley Church. We love God and we love people. 
one of the expressions of loving God is through loving him through our voices, worshiping through our voices. And we're going to do that in just a few moments. Another expression of worshiping God is through our finances, through giving back to God a portion of the income that he's given to us this week. There's a number of ways that that can take place, and whichever way you're most comfortable with is fine with us. You can text to give, text 84321 and follow the link. You can give online, or you can arrange for a porch drop-off or pickup. Whatever way you feel most comfortable with is fine with us. We love God and we love people. You've already heard about the shoebox campaign where we're loving kids around the world. We have a, a privilege and a responsibility to, to ensure that people around the world know of God's love. A local initiative that we've just undertaken over the past few weeks was something we call the Thanksgiving 200 where we set a goal of 200 food bank items that we are going to pass on to our local food bank. And thanks to your love and generosity, we exceeded that goal. Well done, church. So proud of you. As I dropped off those food bank items this week, they let me know that the need has never been greater than it is right now. So church, you did a great job. Your generosity and your love was overflowing. So thankful, so proud of you. You know, right after the service this morning, we have an opportunity to connect with each other through Zoom, and you're invited to be a part of that. If you don't have the Zoom login information, just contact me here at the church, at the church office, and I'll send that right to you so you can be part of our lobby time and fellowship time with our church family. It's a great time of being together. I think that's it for the announcements. I can't think of anything else, so let's pray. And then let's worship. Would you join me? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, good morning. Thanks for this brand new day that you've given to us. A brand new day to receive your love. And a brand new day to love you back. Lord, that's our heart's desire this morning. So Lord, meet with us as we meet with you. Change us. Make us more like Jesus. We give you this service in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I just remembered one more thing. We tonight are launching a brand new online life group called Overcoming Anxiety. It starts at 6 p.m. and it's online and you're invited to join us. If you need that login information, again, just contact me at the church office. I'll be able to email you uh, a study guide for tonight and for the subsequent sessions. But it's a great time of being in God's word together with each other. Hope you would consider that as a possibility for you tonight. Let's worship God together. One, two, three, four.
great worship. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is the day that you have made, and we will continue to rejoice and be glad in it, because you're the God of every part of it. Father, we recognize your holiness, your righteousness, your purity this morning. Lord, and as we see you high and lifted up, we recognize our sinfulness. Father, bring to the forefront of our minds this week the, the sin that we have thought and said and did. Or maybe those things, those things that we should have done but didn't do. Father, we confess these sins to you, turning from them and turning to you for forgiveness, for a fresh start. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your grace and your forgiveness in our lives. Father, through this week, we've been praying for the Crosby family as they've faced some health challenges. Lord, we thank you for your grace in their lives, for new measures of health and life and strength. Continue to be with them through this week. Father, for us now, as we open your word, we pray and ask that you would open our hearts and our eyes so that we can see you and hear you and respond obediently to you. Lord, we love you and we give you our best focus and attention as we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've been going through a series here at Pleasant Valley Church called Following Jesus. We've been going through the book of Luke, through Dr. Luke's account of Jesus' life and ministry here on earth. Two weeks ago, we were um, in Luke chapter 7, and Luke was telling us about how Jesus healed a centurion's servant, and the, the crowd welcomed Jesus. Now we see that, uh, that Jesus is returning to probably Capernaum after visiting another region on off the Sea of Galilee where he had freed a demonized man. The man had so many demons in him, but but Jesus freed the man of these demons. But the crowd didn't like it, so they they wanted Jesus to leave, and Jesus doesn't stay where he isn't wanted. And so he left and now he's probably returning to Capernaum, again, where he healed that centurion's servant. Follow with me if you have your Bibles in Luke chapter 8, beginning at verse 40. Luke writes, Now when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, a ruler of the synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. Well, let's just pause right there and understand what is taking place. Jairus was a synagogue leader. It was the place of Jewish worship in the synagogue, and he would have been well known in town. He would have been um, in a dignified position as he was leading in the synagogue. But he comes to Jesus in brokenness and desperation, falling at Jesus' feet. Why? Because his only daughter, girl of about 12, she was dying. And you better believe that he had done everything that he could have done to bring her back to health. As a dad, like, like Jairus, I would do anything to help my sick kid. I, mean, I would be like the Kool-Aid man breaking through the walls if that's what it took, if I could contribute to my kid's health. So here's Jairus coming and falling at Jesus' feet amongst this, this pressing crowd. Verse 43. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. So for almost as long as Jairus' daughter was old, this lady was bleeding. She was bleeding for 12 years. 
That's troubling. Because in Jewish law, it would have declared her ceremonially unclean, affecting her whole life, her relationships, and her, her self-esteem. She would have been disqualified from marriage. She would have been disqualified from religious life. She couldn't have gone to the synagogue. She felt shame for something she had no control over. You can only imagine her brokenness. Not only is she broke in, she's also broke. She would have used all her financial resources to, to find a doctor to get the treatment to get better. She's broken. She's broke. She's isolated. She's rejected. She's exhausted. She's desperate. And she's reaching out for anything or anyone. And in her shame, she approached Jesus from behind to avoid recognition and embarrassment of being caught. Now, in Jesus' day, rabbis would often have, I'm using, I'm using a scarf, but rabbis would often have a, a, a distinguishing piece of clothing. Um, it would be a prayer shawl. It would have tassels like these. Sometimes they would wear it over their shoulder, but, but mostly, you know how we close our eyes when we pray? In Jewish culture at the time, prayer shawls would be used, and they would kind of go over the head and kind of cause a, a covering, so you're, you're almost in your own compartment here. And so Jesus would have had his, his prayer shawl on, distinguishing him as a rabbi, and the, the tassels would have been at the end. And this lady came and she touched the end of Jesus's prayer shawl where, where the tassels were. It's a biblical thing that is indicative of the Savior, of the Messiah. In Malachi 4.2, it says, But for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings as you go out and leap like calves released from the stall. Remember the song, Hark the Herald Angels Sing? Um, there's a phrase in there, there's a line in there that says, risen with healing in his wings. So sometimes when that prayer shawl was put on, it would almost seem as if it was a, a picture or symbolic of a bird, a mother bird with, with its wings open, protecting her young. And kind of in, in the same way, Jesus here, the, the lady is identifying Jesus, well, he could be the Messiah. And if I just reach out and touch the, the edge of his cloak, I can be healed. And so that's exactly what she did. She wanted the gift of health. And so she reached out from behind and got to touch Jesus. Just the, the hem, the, the part of his robe. Verse 45. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Somebody touched, someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Now Jesus, Jesus knew who touched him. Jesus is God. But he asked this question more as a way of calling out for the one to evidence their faith. Jesus was aware that someone had expressed faith in that they could be healed just by touching his robe, touching the, the fringe of his garment. Verse 47. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Can you imagine how she would have felt after 12 years of fighting this disease, of exhausting every possible road of opportunity. And here Jesus comes, and I can just imagine Jesus putting his hand on her shoulder and saying, Daughter, those words themselves would have been so healing. Remember, because she was ostracized. She was, she was marginalized by society. No one wanted to be near her or have anything to do with her. And here Jesus calls her daughter. Verse 49. 
While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, Don't be afraid, just believe, and she will be healed. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She is not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, my child, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. They gave her, they gave her something to eat. Why is that? Well, because meals signify a restored relationship. And it was, it was a foretaste of the resurrection to come for us. But then Jesus said, don't tell anyone. Remember the people were laughing at Jesus? I don't think they were laughing anymore. But Jesus did something where no words could explain it. Only God could do what Jesus did. And the facts will tell the story. The mom and the dad, they don't have to say anything. Because the facts say that Jesus is God. Jesus didn't just want to be known as the miracle worker, but he wanted to be known as the Savior who saves us in our broken spiritual lives. So six things, six things that we can learn about Jesus from this instant, from this account of the two daughters. Here's the first thing we can learn about Jesus. Number one, Jesus responds to those who step out in faith. Jesus responds to those who step out in faith, even where there is brokenness, even where there is fear and doubt, Jesus responds to those who step out in faith. One of my favorite pastors is a man by the name of Jim Simbola. He pastors in New York City. And he said this, he wrote this in his book, he wrote, I discovered an astonishing truth. God is attracted to weakness. He can't resist those who humbly and honestly admit how desperately they need him. See, Jesus responds to those who step out in faith. No matter how broken they are, no matter how fearful they are, Jesus responds to them. In Hebrews 11, verse 6, it says, And without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Those who are earnestly showing faith in Jesus. Jesus responds to those who step out in faith. Can I ask us a question this morning? What was your last action of faith? What was the last thing that you and I did that showed our faith in God? You know, and if we can't if we can't recollect what that is, maybe it's time maybe it's time for us to show a new measure of faith, to take a new step of faith. Jesus responds to those who step out in faith. Here's a second thing that we can learn about Jesus. Jesus calls for a public followership. Jesus calls for his followers to be public. See, after this woman was healed and she had nothing to be embarrassed about, but she came and Jesus called her out. Who touched me? He knew, but he was calling her out because any follower of Jesus needs to be a public, not a private follower. The proper response that comes when we encounter Jesus is the same response that the woman had, trembling and with thanksgiving and worship to Jesus, falling at his feet. 
Jesus calls for a public followership. You know, one of the best ways we can show that we are followers is by taking the step of obedience in baptism. Have you been baptized yet? If you haven't, would you take that next step of considering it? I would love to send you some literature that explains how we understand and practice baptism at Pleasant Valley Church. And as soon as we can, we'll arrange for a baptism service where you can follow Jesus, where you can identify with his life and death and burial and resurrection. Jesus calls for a public followership. Here's the third thing that we can learn about Jesus. Number three, there are no insignificant people in Jesus's eyes. There are no insignificant people in Jesus's eyes. A 12 year old girl and a medically challenged woman both mattered. They're both loved. They're both significant in Jesus's eyes. There are no insignificant people. You matter. You matter to God. God loves you. No matter how broken we may be, God loves us. He loves us so much that Jesus died for us. There are no insignificant people in Jesus' eyes. Here's the fourth thing that we can learn about Jesus. Number four, Jesus is all about relationship. Jesus is all about relationship. Isn't it interesting to note that he calls this woman daughter. We don't know what her real name is, but we know the the closeness of the relationship that Jesus had with her. He calls her daughter. He calls us son and daughter. It's interesting that, that Jesus invited Jairus and his wife, along with the three disciples, into the room as he resurrected the girl back from the dead. He's, he's all about relationship. And no one goes unnoticed by Jesus who shows faith. Not the woman, not Jairus, not us. Jesus is all about relationship. Here's the fourth thing that we can learn about Jesus from this account. Uh, the, the fifth thing, nothing is too difficult for Jesus. Nothing is too difficult for Jesus. For Jesus, bringing someone back from the dead is just as easy as waking someone who is sleeping up. Wasn't hard to do. Jesus did it. Nothing is too difficult for Jesus. No matter the brokenness, Jesus can heal us. No matter how much sin there is, Jesus can and has forgiven us. Nothing is too difficult for Jesus. What's the difficulty that you're facing this morning? Where do you need Jesus to intervene in your life this morning? Nothing is too difficult for Jesus. Here's the sixth truth, the sixth thing that we can learn about Jesus. Jesus shows up in dark times, but he doesn't prevent dark times. And both truths are important. Jesus shows up in dark times. He showed up for Jairus. He showed up for this woman. Jesus shows up in dark times, but he doesn't prevent dark times. And following Jesus doesn't mean that we're going to leave a pain, we're going to live a pain-free life. We won't. Following Jesus means that we're trusting him. We're obeying him as best we can, as best we know how. We're showing that faith in him. Jesus shows up in heart in dark times, but he doesn't prevent dark times. But he is there for you. And for me in those dark times. So those are six things we can learn about Jesus. But I want to share three things that we can also learn about faith. About our faith in Jesus. Here's the first one. Faith is more than knowing the facts. 
Faith is more than just knowing the facts. It's not just an intellectual understanding. Faith is more than just knowing the facts. You could memorize the Bible front to back and back to front, from Genesis to maps. Uh, faith is more than just knowing the facts. Let me take that one step further. Here's a second truth about what we can learn about faith. Faith is action. For Jairus, it was seeking Jesus, believing Jesus could bring his daughter back to life, could bring healing to his daughter. For the woman, it was an action step of reaching out and touching the robe. Action shows belief. And really, you only believe what you do. Can I say that one more time? You only believe what you do. It's easy to talk. It's easy to say that, oh, we have faith, we believe. It's easy to talk it, but it's a different story to walk it, to live it out, to take it public. Faith is action. Action shows what we do or do not believe. Here's the third thing that we can learn about faith. It's this. Despair and pain should take us to Jesus and not push us away from him. See, for this lady, her, her pain, her brokenness, it didn't keep her from Jesus. She didn't say, Jesus, thanks, but no thanks. Instead, it was just the opposite. She reached out. She touched the, the hem of his robe. Despair and pain should bring us to Jesus and not push us away from him. I love those words in verse 50, those four words. I've said them over in my life, and maybe you need to say them in your life, in your life today. Don't fear, just believe. Where, where do you need to say that in your life today? Don't fear, just believe. You know, as we talk about faith amid brokenness, the greatest gift that Jesus gave was not earthbound temporary healing. The greatest gift that Jesus gave was that of eternal relationship with him. And we can have that faith amid our brokenness, just like the two daughters. Just like the two daughters, we can be healed from our sins and resurrected to a new life in Jesus. So come to Jesus, desperate for spiritual healing from your brokenness. Come to Jesus because you know you are spiritually dead in sin and only Jesus can give you a new life. Believe that Jesus is God that he died on the cross to save us from our sins and that he came back from the dead to show that payment was made in full. And then commit. Commit your life to following Jesus. Let your life show your belief. Admit that you're a sinner. Believe that Jesus is the Savior and commit your life to following him. Let your life show your belief. Would you join with me in prayer? Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for Luke's account of these two daughters. Lord, and what you did, how you transformed their lives. Lord, this morning, you offer that same transformation to us here this morning. You offer to heal our brokenness, to, to bring us from spiritual death to spiritual life. Lord, we can do that by trusting you. Lord, help us to take that next step this morning. Maybe that next step of faith is in baptism. Lord, speak to us. Maybe that next step of faith is in our finances or in our relationships. Maybe it's forgiving someone. Maybe it's seeking to bring peace into a relationship. Lord, whatever it is, help us. Help us to take that next step of faith, even as we're in brokenness. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the truth and the, transform, the transforming power of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Hey, hope you can join us for our Zoom connection time. It's our, our lobby time. Uh, follow the link off the screen there or call the church office. Love to give you the, the password so that you can log in and be a part of our church family connection time. God bless you. I love you. I'm praying for you. Hope to see you next Sunday. God bless you until then. One, two, three, four. Yeah.